All right, so I'm here with uh, Gavin Andreessen. Um, he is many things to Bitcoin, um, and I don't want to try to explain all of them. So, Gavin, if you could sort of um, introduce yourself, and I know over the years your your role has changed a bit through Bitcoin. So, if you can kind of walk us through kind of the beginning up until now. Sure. Um, so I stumbled across Bitcoin in 2010 uh, accidentally. I was kind of looking around for an interesting open source software project to contribute to and stumbled across Bitcoin and then got sucked in pretty much as deep as you can get. So I, I took over from the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto in uh, the beginning of 2011. He stepped back and kind of pushed me forward as the leader of the, the open source software project. Um, and so I was the, the lead developer for the Bitcoin open source software project for several years. Um, I stepped out of that role a couple of years ago uh, to try to focus on kind of higher level issues uh, with the technology of Bitcoin. So doing a little more research and a little less software development. At least that was the idea. Um, very recently, I've been sucked back into doing some software development uh, for Bitcoin. Um, so I still remain, you know, heavily involved in all things Bitcoin. Uh, I try really hard not to be the, what I call the celebrity spokesmodel for Bitcoin, uh, basically because I don't like traveling and I don't really like, uh, you know, it's okay to stand up in crowds and talk about Bitcoin, but I don't want to do that all day long. I really am a computer geek who's most comfortable sitting behind my keyboard, you know, working on technology, doing interesting things with the technology. So that, that's, that's me. And once, once you kind of moved from that um, core developer role into, into sort of, I, I don't know, you, you were, I think now you're considered, or you're the chief architect of Bitcoin. Is that your official title? Or? I have a couple titles. So the, I'm chief scientist of the Bitcoin Foundation, uh, which if I could go back in time, I'd probably choose a different title than chief scientist. My wife is actually a scientist. My wife's a geologist. Um, so I always feel a little bit embarrassed <laughs> giving the chief scientist title because I know what a real scientist does and that's really not what I do. But that is my title at the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, and I joined the MIT's Digital Currency Initiative uh, last year. Um, uh, and uh, I think my title there is Digital Currency Developer. So a little bit more modest title there. Um, but basically I'm, I'm kind of troublemaker in the Bitcoin world, always giving my opinion and and really, you know, working to try to make the system better. Can you talk a little bit about those two organizations, the Bitcoin Foundation and the MIT um, Digital um, <clears throat> Group, um, like what what both of those, um, the mandates are for both of those groups? Sure. So the foundation was founded um, back when the Bitcoin price was about $10. I know that because my salary was paid in Bitcoin when I worked at the Bitcoin Foundation and, and I had a, a couple months there when my salary was inflated because they were only adjusting my salary once every three months instead of once every month. Um, and so I got a windfall because Bitcoin prices like, shot up. Um, and it was pretty early um, and the, the mandate of the Bitcoin Foundation was just to try to do things that would help Bitcoin grow and one of those things frankly, was to pay me a salary. Uh, at that point, I was a volunteer. Uh, my wife was getting a little bit, um, I wouldn't say annoyed. <laughs> but she, you know, Impatient is probably the right word uh, for me working full time on what she called my make pretend money project. <laughs> um, and so part of the, the, the idea of the foundation was to try to get people from the Bitcoin industry together to pay developers, to you know, pay for infrastructure that's needed just to keep the thing going, pay for the website, pay for um, you know, the you know, little kind of niggly things that, that, that just that the, that the open source software project needed. Um, and I also had bigger ambitions to try to interact with lawmakers. Uh, this was back before it was starting to become clear at all how uh, lawmakers all over the world would treat Bitcoin. Um, and also do some kind of PR to try to give Bitcoin a better image than um, dirty drug money, which was, you know, really maybe still is the image of Bitcoin uh, in a lot of places. Uh, and so it was, it was pretty ambitious. I think it might have been too ambitious. Uh, the foundation is really had a lot of trouble over the last year or so. Um, two foundation board members 
one of them's already in jail and another one is looks like he might be headed for jail um, which is terrible which is horrible you know to, for two former board members to end up in jail is just horrible for an organization um, and so the foundation is really having a lot of trouble rebuilding kind of reputation and trust and and they're trying hard to do it they have a completely new board um, I'm still associated with the foundation and I hope that they're successful uh, but we'll see it's really hard to rebuild trust yeah so the digital currency initiative is an academic initiative so the idea is MIT was doing a bunch of Bitcoin projects uh, that were really interesting and uh, Joy Ito at the MIT Media Lab thought it would be a cool idea to have an initiative inside the, the MIT Media Lab to figure out what Bitcoin and digital currencies kind of mean, you know, kind of organize research, organize workshops, organize, uh, you know, kind of hook the, connect the academic, all the academic work that's being done in Bitcoin to the practical work that people like me do on Bitcoin. So that's the idea of the Digital Currency Initiative. Um, it's still pretty new, and so I think Digital Currency Initiative is still trying to figure out, you know, what are they going to be in the Bitcoin world? Um, but it's exciting. There's all sorts of really great research happening and a lot of good people involved in the Digital Currency Initiative. So that's that's what those two organizations are. I think MIT was, I mean, they were one of the first campuses that really got involved in, in Bitcoin and digital currency. I remember, I don't know if it was a couple of years ago that they were just offering free Bitcoin to all the all the students or they did a like yeah that. they did a Bitcoin drop um, which it's really interesting there'll be some research papers coming out uh, very soon um, talking about the results of what happens if you give Bitcoin to undergraduates um, so they gave I think a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin to every single MIT undergraduate or at least they gave every single MIT undergraduate the opportunity to get a hundred hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and so I know there's uh, there's you know some economists who are actually looking at what did the students do with it, what what students decided to take up the offer and what didn't, and does it make sense if you're an engineering major versus a liberal arts major on how quickly you spent your Bitcoin or what you spent it on or all these other interesting uh, research topics. So I'm really looking forward to reading some of that research. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Um, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this question. Um, I'm sure you're tired of answering it, but um, what was what was kind of your interaction um, with Satoshi Nakamoto? Um, I mean, it was it was emails, it was forum posts. Was it that type of a thing? Yeah, it was all electronic, and it was all non real time. So I never had an IRC chat uh, with Satoshi. I never had a phone call with Satoshi. It was always kind of non-real-time electronic. So forum posts, private messages on forums, or email are the ways that we communicated. Um, and we communicated pretty darn regularly uh, from you know May of 2010 until he stepped away completely in, I think it was March of 2011. Um, and I haven't heard from him since 2011. Um, him, her, or them, I should say. Right, exactly. I don't actually know it's a him. I think it's a him. <laughs> um, since 2010, um, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the Bitcoin network? Um, and I, I guess first, I, I would say I'm asking this question from a technical standpoint. Um, uh, well, when I first got involved, I mean, there was very little transaction volume, um, not a whole lot of interest so I, I was involved very early I didn't realize it but at the time I got involved like the very first dollar to Bitcoin exchange had only been running for a month uh, or something and I, I tell the story that uh, I, I, I ran a site called the Bitcoin faucet which is famous in the Bitcoin world for it was a website where you could go and I would give you some Bitcoin um, and when I started the faucet I was giving away five Bitcoin um, because I spent $50 and bought 10,000 Bitcoin because Bitcoins were worth one half of one cent a piece. And so I could afford to give away five Bitcoin because there's only two and a half cents per person. Um, and I did that to kind of help bootstrap the economy, try to get people using it um, for stuff. Um, 
those 10,000 Bitcoins, if I'd held on to them, would be worth quite a bit of money right now. Um, but I, I, I don't regret doing that. You know, you had to do that to kind of bootstrap the whole thing. And so that, that kind of shows you how Bitcoin has grown since I've been involved. It really was very low transaction volume. Not a lot of people using it for not a lot of stuff. Um, as it evolved, uh, I think like a lot of technologies, it, it kind of started in, in the shady underbelly. <laughs> so if you think about other, other technologies um, that have evolved over time, uh, you know, VHS tapes in video stores used to be infamous for people who wanted pornography and, you know, didn't want to go to the peep show booth on Times Square, right? You could, you could watch naked people in the <laughs> private and comfort of your own home for the very first time. Um, and that really bootstrapped, you know, VHS tapes. And of course, now we don't really associate VHS tapes with sex, right? It's just movies. It's right. mainstream. And we've seen the same evolution with Bitcoin. I mean, really, it started with the Silk Road. It was very popular, you know, buy drugs online using this digital currency, digital cash. Um, it, I, it, it was interesting to watch it evolve into kind of the gray market. So gambling was a huge market. And it really still is a huge market for, for Bitcoin. I think a lot of Bitcoin transactions are people funding online gambling accounts or doing gambling on the blockchain, uh, which there was a website called um, Satoshi Dice, which you sent Bitcoin to one of many Satoshi Dice Bitcoin addresses, and then either you won or you didn't. And if you won, you got more Bitcoin back than you sent to that address. And it was all done on the blockchain, all done in a way that was provably secure. There's no way for them to cheat, or if they did cheat, you'd be able to see that they were cheating. Um, and is wildly popular. I don't understand it. I don't. I'm not a gambler myself. Uh, seems dumb to me to play a game where you're <laughs> destined to lose. Um, but it's it was wildly popular. And at one point, I think Satoshi Dice was like 60% of the transaction volume on the Bitcoin network. Um, and I think that is the evolution. It's gone. You know, black market buy drugs, gray market, do some gambling, and really we're just seeing mainstream uses of Bitcoin uh, happen now. So online shopping, you know, when you can buy your Xbox subscription and pay in Bitcoin, you know Bitcoin's starting to go mainstream. And, we're in, and I, I expect that to continue, just those mainstream sorts of uses, both for, for buying stuff and then also um, a big change I've seen over the last year or so is Wall Street being really interested in Bitcoin as just an asset that that investors might want to hold, an asset that's not tied to the stock market, it's not tied to how much gold mining is happening, it's a completely kind of independent uh, asset with its own volatility, its own you know risk profile, and uh, for investors who are looking or I should say wealthy investors <laughs> who are willing to, to in, you know, who have risky assets in their portfolio. portfolio. Another risky asset <laughs> it, that, that is like independent of the other risky assets that they right. hold makes a lot of sense for them. So that's another interesting change uh, kind of on the big level that I've seen. Um, and, th and that does drive the technology. Uh, it's interesting that people look at you know, what should happen with the technology based on what their own particular use case for Bitcoin is. So, you know, if you're making a lot of Bitcoin transactions, then you want to, you know, want to see the focus be on that. If you, if you are, you know, storing Bitcoin as an asset, you want to see the technology focus on that. And I think there's a lot of tension in the Bitcoin world between people who have these kind of two different views of, of what is Bitcoin for. Um, and then, of course, it's so a whole third use of Bitcoin that's also taken off that has affected the technology, and that's using the the using Bitcoin not as a not as a cash, not as a currency, uh, but using the fact that there is this global public ledger, there's this record of transactions that have happened, and then kind of tying other assets or tying other information onto those transactions uh, is something that's that's really taken off over the last couple of years. Um, and that's kind of yet another third set of people who think, ah, this Bitcoin is a, is a money, doesn't really matter. We think Bitcoin will be used as this ledger where you record, I don't know, stock trades or, uh, you know, 
issue stock on the blockchain and then pay dividends using the blockchain. Um, kind of a digital bearer token for any kind of token that you might want. Yeah, that's um, another <clears throat> that's another area Wall Street has been getting involved in recently. It seems is, is just the technology of it. Not not only just the asset as like a hedge, but also kind of <clears throat> seeing how they can profit off of the actual blockchain technology, whether it's Bitcoin or some sort of in-house um, yeah, so invention. The, the banks are very interested in kind of optimizing all sorts of internal cruft they've built up over the years. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing initiatives where lots of banks get together and say, we don't really like Bitcoin. We do like the blockchain. We do like the idea of this, this ledger that nobody owns but is public and secure. Um, and that's a really powerful idea for them, all right? I mean, none of the banks completely trust each other. Uh, and they would, you know, they probably trust the government, depending on which government you're talking about. Um, but the idea of this this public ledger that they all share, that they can use to kind of you know trade assets back and forth, uh, but that no one particular bank owns is really appealing to them. It makes a lot of sense. It really does. Um, and so there, you know, we see we see initiatives to create blockchains that aren't Bitcoin uh, used for that kind of thing. Used used you know between a consortium of banks or something to replace. The uh, the SWIFT network or the mm -hmm. Fedwire or these other you know these other legacy systems that they're using to move money around the world um, that were built long ago uh, that aren't all that secure that um, nobody really fully trusts um, with something much better. Um, let me let me now hit you with kind of the question that I, I guess I get approached with most. Um, and I'm sorry, this is an unfair question, but um, it's, it goes something like this. Um, I, I just don't get it. I don't get what Bitcoin is. Like, how do you res how would you respond to that? I mean, it depends on who's asking the question. So, you know, if it's friends or family, uh, I say it's an it's an experiment and a new way of doing money. Um, that's kind of the short answer. It's just an experiment with a new way, a modern way of doing money, right? If you think about the way money has been done in the recent past is governments issue the money and then we all trust it. Um, and we trust that the government's going to stamp out counterfeiting and is not going to inflate it too much and is not going to confiscate it. Um, and here in the US, our trust is warranted, right? The United States dollar is money for the entire world. Uh, there are all sorts of countries around the world that actually use the U.S. dollar as their money, basically. Um, I'll be going to Barbados in a few weeks for a conference, and the Barbados dollar is pegged two Barbadian dollars equals one dollar. That's just the way it is. And, and um, you know, they have hooked their wagon to the mighty U.S. dollar, which is the reserve currency for the entire world. Other places in the world, uh, that trust is not so well placed. So a place like uh, Zimbabwe, I have a, I keep a $100 trillion Zimbabwe note. Yes, that's a T trillion with a T, uh, which was the highest note that they printed in 2009 until they gave up uh, and decided that they're, you know, nobody was gonna trust their currency anymore because they, they hyperinflated it away. Um, looks like something similar is happening in, in Venezuela right now. Venezuelan Bolivar uh, is in a horrible inflationary spiral where it becomes worth and worth less. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin, the digital currency, which is the easiest thing to explain, um, is meant to be a, another way of doing money that doesn't require you to put your trust in a central organization. You don't need to trust the government. You don't need to trust the company. Uh, if you're a geek like me, you can read the code and you can trust that the code is correct. Um, but if you're just an ordinary person, you can you know, think about it, read about it. And you, if you do enough work, you can convince yourself that, yeah, this, this, this might work as, as a new way of doing money. 
Okay. Um, and kind of sometimes the implicit question behind that one is, um, but my my Visa Mastercard works just fine. Like, why would I? Why do I care about new money? This 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 is like I live in America. Everything's fine. Most people in America probably shouldn't care about Bitcoin yet. That's the main. That's unless, like I said, unless you have some uh, like you're wealthy enough to have a little bit of like risky investment in your portfolio, in which case it's probably a good idea just to have a little bit of Bitcoin uh, in your personal portfolio, just in case it takes off and replaces the dollar as the world's reserve currency in 20 years. If that happens, Bitcoin prices today will look really low. If it doesn't happen, maybe Bitcoin prices will be zero. But you know, it's, it's, it's high pot potential reward low risk if you you know don't invest your life savings in bitcoin and I, I always tell people not to do that but for ordinary everyday transactions um yeah frankly there's not a whole lot of reason for for most people to use bitcoin um and there won't be until the real big problem with using bitcoin as a as a transactional currency right now is nobody's paid a salary in bitcoin i mean i was when i was paid by the bitcoin foundation and that was super convenient for me uh, when I wanted to buy things in Bitcoin because my salary was paid in Bitcoin. If I want to buy something in Bitcoin, I just spend the Bitcoin I got at the beginning of the month in my salary paycheck. But until that happens for ordinary people, I'm not sure Bitcoin will, will take off because otherwise, how do you earn Bitcoin? How do you just get them as part of your, your natural life? Um, and there are Bitcoin companies that are trying to crack that nut are trying to find a way where where just as part of your ordinary everyday life you have a trickle of bitcoins uh coming in and there are different ideas on how to do that but until that happens i don't think it will take off as you know a currency that you're going to be using to buy stuff online and certainly not a currency where you're going to be using it regularly to buy stuff uh in stores at least not here in the u.s um other places in the world uh where Credit cards aren't common. Um, maybe it will take off quicker. Um, I read an article just a couple days ago about how in India, uh, a huge percentage of online purchases are done cash on delivery. So be just because they don't have the kind of credit card infrastructure there. Most Indians don't have credit cards to pay for Amazon, you know, and, and they, and so, you know, a delivery person shows up at your door and you have to have a pile of cash to like physically hand over the cash uh, to pay for your purchase. Um, and that'll work, but that's not very efficient. Um, all sorts of opportunity for theft and corruption and, mm. and um, it's certainly not convenient. So, you know, in a, in a situation like that, um, and certainly in, in places like Africa where you know, the, the, the infrastructure is just not you know, the banking infrastructure and the financial inf infrastructure isn't there. Um, maybe that'll be the first place where we actually see Bitcoin used as a common um, payment vehicle. Uh, but we'll see. I don't know. Like I said, I mean, you know, people tend to think of Bitcoin as, you know, a PayPal replacement first. That's the kind of obvious um, use for it. Uh, that's probably not going to be the first big use of it, at least not for, for ordinary people. Um, it might first be, and I know there are, there, are, there are Bitcoin companies using Bitcoin as kind of the payment rails in the background for international money transfers, uh, just because it's a lot cheaper to move money around the world if you're using Bitcoin rather than go through the traditional banking system where there are all sorts of artificial barriers at these imaginary lines we call borders, uh, which are completely imaginary when you're talking about the internet. Um, and so it, it may become really big uh, and invisible in, in the background. I mean, that's another possible path for Bitcoin to evolve. And what about micropayments? Do you think that's gonna play a, a role sort of in Bitcoin's future? Micropayments directly on Bitcoin don't make sense. Um, but there are people working on technical layers above Bitcoin that would enable micropayments. Like and when I say micropayments, I mean like less than a dollar. Um, so, you know, paying a tenth of a cent for to see a New York Times article. Uh, 
which makes a ton of sense, actually. You know, people would love to, and there are companies working on solving that problem, um, to try to, you know, just as part of your ordinary everyday life, again, get a trickle of Bitcoin in uh, and then be able to make micropayments with that to, to pay for online activities, maybe. Um, we see a little bit of that with, like, the change tip uh, company where you can, you know, tip people for great Reddit comments or tip mm -hmm. people for... Um, you know other things on the internet um, and and we'll see where that goes um, and building that as a layer above Bitcoin makes a lot of sense doing it directly in the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't make sense you don't want every hundredth of a cent transaction to be broadcast to this network of thousands of nodes all over the world um, so we do need technical solutions um, to make micropayments uh, technically workable and these are sort of these off-chain like lightning network solutions that kind of aggregate these micropayments and then and then advertise the kind of the bundle of, of all of those in, in one transaction is it does it exactly work it's okay. it's things like um, yes exactly things like lightning or if even if you look at change tip uh, you know change tip is doing micropayments um, and the way it works is you just have a change tip wallet that you know you have to trust change tip not to run away with all the money they're probably trustworthy you know you can i know where their offices are in silicon <laughs> valley and i've met the people who are running it and you know it's responsible venture capitalists and it's not you know some shady uh nobody uh doing change tip um and that'll work right i mean you know if you trust them not to run away with the money that works for micropayments and then just a micropayment is just change tip moving balances around in their system mm -hmm. Um, and then if you want to cash out, you know, that's a real Bitcoin transaction that you can then take to other services. So that gives you the, you know, it's not a closed system. You, you don't have to trust them all the way. You don't have to trust them for all time. Um, you know, you can get money out. Um, Lightning means even less trust. So the Lightning network, you can think of that as like, you know, taking, there's no entity that owns the wallet kind of the wallet is on the Bitcoin network uh, and is a really interesting idea uh, and I hope it succeeds uh, we'll see okay Gavin I want to be conscious of your time here um, so maybe just uh, one more question um, so like these micro payments it's kind of a good segue right you say you don't want to sort of like broadcast like a zillion like tenth of a cent transactions to the network um, over the past six months I know there's been a lot of talk about what's the best way to sort of scale um, <clears throat> Bitcoin so that it can it can do like um, you know on the level of transactions it's something like Visa or MasterCard can um, or at least or at least a high, a high enough volume that that we're not going to run into any issues in the near future um, so uh, and this this has kind of been in the news a lot over the last week, so I thought maybe you would be a good guy to sort of talk to what's currently in the pipeline for, or what the current state of things are, and, and what are the solutions that are kind of coming up to address them. Sure, so... Uh, I think everybody agrees that we need to scale, that the... That the uh, you know, we need to, there's some technical fixes we need to make to, to handle more transaction volume. Um, there's disagreement on kind of how much consensus we have on how to do that. Um, and there's disagreement on how much consensus do we need to do that. So, so the state of things right now is there are kind of the, the, I think the community is split between a, a set of developers who think we need absolutely overwhelming consensus, you know, like 99.9% of people to all agree that we need to make this technical change. Um, and then there's everybody else, including myself, who think that's crazy. And, and you know, if we have 80, 85% consensus uh, that that things need to change that that's sufficient and you know we should move forward and make the technical fixes that we need to scale up 
Um, this has been really painful for everybody. Uh, this 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 split. Um, you see it in the, the Bitcoin Core project came out with a scaling roadmap that I actually I like the scaling roadmap long term and I completely agree with kind of everything on their long term scaling network and I think a year from now everything will be just fine. It's just a, it's really a question of you know what do we do in the in the short term. Um, Bitcoin businesses are hurting right now because we're running into this this scaling limit that was imposed way back in 2010. Um, Satoshi imposed a, a limit on the number of transactions that the network can handle. And at the time he said, we'll raise the limit when we need to. And we need to. <laughs> and so we need to raise the limit. Um, but again, you know, there's this disagreement about, well, can you really make that kind of change without getting everybody, pretty much everybody to buy in? Um, or is it okay if, again, you know, there's kind of super majority people agree that it needs to be done. Um, and so the project is actually split. So I'm, I'm helping out with a project called Bitcoin Classic that will double the number of transactions that can happen, that can, that the, the network can handle. Um, the Bitcoin Core project, which is the project I was lead developer of, has a different, more complicated way of doing like one and a half times the number of transactions. Um, and we just have this big technical disagreement and right now where things are up in the air we'll see which happens I hope that both happen right I hope that we get you know a, a, a just a, a simple doubling of capacity and then I hope we have another like 1.6 on top of that it will be great um, and then we need a long-term plan for how are we going to scale up to visa level transaction volume which is the which is the goal, um, which I think we should do. So, you know, it, it won't be over even once this current kind of crisis happens. Um, and it really gets, it gets into you know, who controls Bitcoin? What's the governance process? How do we make these kinds of decisions in a way that's, that's fair and that works? Um, it used to be Satoshi, was the dictator. He got to make decisions. He just decided we're gonna have this limit. So he put in the limit. Uh, everybody went along because there weren't that many people back then. There were no Bitcoin companies. Bitcoin was worth half a penny a piece. Uh, you know, all the Bitcoin in the world were worth like twenty thousand dollars or something ridiculously small. Um, it's turned into this global multi-billion-dollar industry, and so there are a lot more people interested now. Um, and Bitcoin needs to grow up. And and I look towards the way other technologies that we rely on, like the internet, which we're using to talk to each other right now, um, how those are governed. And so there are standards organizations like the Internet Engineering Task Force that have gone through all of this. If you go back and you look at knockdown, drag out fights over, I don't know, all sorts of technical things, um, there's been a process developed over time that seems to work pretty well, uh, that creates pretty darn good technologies uh, that we all use every day. And so Bitcoin just needs to, to go through that same process and, and end up with, you know, a way of evolving the technology that that can evolve and and that you know everybody is is mostly happy with. All right, great, Gavin. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know you're a, a busy guy, and I know this has been an extremely busy week. I don't know if it's busier than your normal week, but it sure seems like it. Um, it has been busier than normal. Yeah, I'll actually go back to writing code as soon as, uh, as, soon as we say goodbye. <laughs> okay, great. Um, again, thanks, and uh, I wish, wish you all the best. Thanks a lot. Great talking to you. All right. See you again.